So welcome, everybody. Uh, what I thought I would talk about today is access and affordability in American higher education. And I'm going to take as given the importance to America for individuals, the economy, and our society more generally of higher education. And I'm going to just jump right in and address a variety of challenges that we're currently facing, um, in particular in increasing the share of our population that completes a higher education degree. And I'll finish up with possible ways forward and leave some time for a Q&A. Um, I'll talk about FASER's efforts to recruit and graduate a socioeconomically diverse student body along the way. Uh, and we can also come back to this. But I wanted to put our efforts within the context of the national issues. So what are some of these challenges? Let me turn to these. Problem number one, college attainment rates have stalled in the United States. The share of our population going on to higher education increased throughout much of the 20th century. In 1940, only about 6% of 25 to 34-year-olds had a BA. This increased to around 30% in the year 2000 and has stayed there for much of the decade. There are reasons to suspect that absent actions on our part, these rates are not going to continue to improve and might actually decline. When we look at the demographics and see who the 18-year-olds are and who they'll be in the coming years, uh, we are seeing growth in populations with lower higher education attainment rates. And if we want to see the aggregate rates improve, doing something about these particular demographic groups will be really, really important. In particular, just as an example, the share of Latinos in our population is increasing, and their college-going rates are significantly lower on average. In, 19, in 2012, while about 33 percent of 25 to 34-year-olds had a BA, only 11 percent of Hispanic males did, as an example. Much of the rest of the world is responding to the demand in the labor market for skilled workers with increased educational attainment, but we are not. We used to be among the most highly educated societies. We are now uh, no longer in the top nine. By this measure, we're tied for about 10th. Where Vassar and schools like Vassar can help is by taking more lower income students because of our high graduation rates. But of course, we also need to get more students into and through to graduation across all of higher education. Problem number two, who goes to college depends on income and race and not only merit. This is problematic because, because it means that we are not taking advantage of talented people and also because notions of basic fairness are important to a functioning society. If only some groups have access to a middle or upper middle income uh, life, it will be difficult to have the kind of society that we claim to be, one committed to equal opportunity and social mobility. Again, just some data, while 44% of whites aged 25 to 64 have a higher education credential, only 28% of blacks do, only 20% of Hispanics and 23% of Native Americans. Educational attainment also differs by family income. A little over 80% of students in the top third of the income distribution go to college versus a little over 50% in the bottom third. So given all these data, the only way to get college attainment up in the aggregate is to get it up for the demographic groups for which it is currently low, including students from lower income families and African-American, Latino, and Native American families, and men. Vassar has intentionally, over the last decade, increased its recruitment of lower income students and students of color, and we're graduating them. Again, we are a small sector, but it seems to me that every sector needs to do its part in these efforts. Okay, third problem is, is costs. At a time when getting access to higher education has become increasingly important, the costs have gone up rapidly. And I do want to do just a little short economics lesson here. Uh, I just kind of can't resist. Um, but it's really important to understand the distinctions among cost, price, and net price. They get confused by families, students, and public policymakers all the time, muddying the discussions both about the problems and the solutions. The cost of producing a year of education is just that, what it costs an institution to pay for the inputs that produce a year's worth of education for a student. 
So faculty salaries, keeping on the lights, materials for chemistry labs or studio art classes, et cetera. The cost does not include financial aid or other scholarships, such as merit scholarships. Those just affect the price that schools ask particular students to pay for a year of that education. So let's turn to price. The sticker price, or tuition, room, board, and fees, or total student charges, is the price. At most institutions, the cost is greater than price. Most institutions of higher education are in the public or private nonprofit sector, which is why cost can exceed price, something that a private for-profit firm cannot do for very long. The difference is covered by things like gifts. Your colleges and universities are probably in touch with you about their annual funds. Uh, and I happen to know there's a Vassar grad in the room. Maybe there's some more. There's still time to give any amount every year. The gap is also filled by earnings on the endowment, um, which is the result of different kinds of gifts as well as past savings, and public appropriations from state governments for public institutions, and other important items like federal, foundation, and state grants, for example. Costs have been going up very rapidly, uh, way above inflation. The reason is, is at least in part the same reason that the return on higher education has gone up. Skilled labor is being rewarded in the current economy. Higher education is one of the most skilled labor-intensive sectors in the economy, along with physician and legal services. At the same time, higher education has not benefited from the technological progress that other sectors have experienced. We haven't figured out how to teach a seminar with more students or fewer faculty members without significantly changing the quality of, those, of that experience. And this is the, called the Baumol cost disease. Prices, compared to costs, have also been going up by different amounts in different sectors. And importantly, cost and price don't have to go together, as I mentioned. In fact, recently, the most, recent, the most rapid price increases have been in the public sector and have been driven by reductions in public support appropriations and not necessarily cost increases. Prices have also risen in the private nonprofits, but by less. Finally, net prices are really important, and these are the prices that students pay after taking into account any financial aid or scholarships. These have risen at different rates than either prices or costs. Bottom line, costs are up, prices are up, and net prices are doing different things in different sectors. But overall, many families are facing rising prices and net prices in many cases, as our society has shifted the responsibility for paying for higher, higher education away from the public sector and towards individual families. Vassar has chosen, along with many other, but not all, privates, to get net price down for lower income families and the number of those lower income students up, which implies an increased financial aid budget. This implies controlling costs elsewhere in the budget to be financially sustainable. Fourth problem is rising income inequality which is not unrelated to everything I've already talked about. The share of national income claimed by households in the top 20%, 5%, and 1% of the income distribution have all increased between the 1970s and the start of this decade. This, of course, reflects in part the return to higher education and the differing attainment rates by income level. But this increasing income inequality is also increasing the challenges that American higher education faces. It's going to make it more difficult for higher education to play a role in contributing to equal opportunity and social mobility and moderating further increases in income inequality in the future. Increasing income inequality directly contributes to increasing costs through the price of skilled labor. In addition, real income growth that is skewed towards higher income families creates challenges for higher education because the highest income families are willing and able to pay the full sticker price and schools compete for these students, supplying the services that they want, further pushing up costs. Single rooms, great food, smaller classes, great faculty, career counseling, organic lawn care, just to name a few. <laughs> At the same time, many schools have been committed to recruiting and educating a socioeconomically diverse student body, but with lower income families' incomes, lagging behind the top groups because of increased income inequality, and in fact actually falling incomes in real terms in some cases, there's a greater need for financial aid. 
and this makes the commitment to financial aid more and more difficult to sustain.